You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Uh, but while we're, while we're waiting for people to to come back, I'll just uh, uh, share a couple of comments that have uh, come back in. Um, uh, someone called Michelle Hall, thank you, uh, says we should have trauma-informed schools so educators know how to implement interventions directly. Um, there is very little understanding of ACEs. I think that means uh, ad- uh, is that adverse uh, childhood uh, ex- experiences amongst uh, education, the education profession. Um, uh, Barbara Driscoll um, my dissertation on juvenile justice in Ireland frontline workers had little or no knowledge of restorative justice. More training and awareness of this practice is required here in Ireland and needs a dedicated body to monitor. So um, work for you to do there, Vivian, obviously. OK, I'm, I'm really keen to get the show back on the road. So I'm hoping um, our uh, international audience is back on YouTube, but the round table is reconvened. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you feel uh, refreshed and, and stretched uh, because we want to uh, give the floor uh, to, to Luke uh, Roberts. Um, and if I can uh, just get my crib sheet in place. Uh, thank you, Luke. We're going to give the floor to you in due course, but let me just say a few words uh, of welcome. Now, I'm not going to hold this against you because some of my best friends are lawyers, Luke, uh, but Luke originally uh, trained as a lawyer and is a restorative practitioner and has been a trainer and consultant for almost 20 years. And particularly in the light of the last couple of comments, which bridge beautifully into your uh, session, has worked in primary, secondary and special schools as well as alternative pr- provision and pupil pupil referral units. And I also did a placement in a pupil referral unit, Luke, you might be interested to know. So he's worked across the youth just justice system, and I'm delighted uh, to hand the floor to you because it's yet another arena where restorative justice is very valuable. Over to you, Luke. Uh, thank you, John, for that. And do keep me to time, please, as well. I will, I will jump in, don't worry. Thank you. Um, so, hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, my kind of, like, opening co- comment is, having worked across the kind of school-to-prison pipeline, um, I tend to think it was a production line more than a pipeline, because I think a pipeline suggests you slip in and fall through, whereas a production line says that actually particular services and sectors contribute to the criminality of children. So that's always important to be mindful of. Um, And what I would say is that there are certain sectors that are much more resilient to restorative justice and restorative approaches than other parts as well. Um, Having trained police officers and prison officers as well as youth justice board, um, youth justice teams, and also worked at a strategic level um, with government departments, you do get a sense of, well, is knowledge being transferred um, and what type of knowledge? I think that's one of the things that um, I was really desperate to ask Anna when she was talking, well, what do you mean by knowledge? Um, Do you mean knowing or do you mean information? Because I think there is quite a lot of information flows that happen, but in terms of knowing about restorative approaches or restorative justice, um, that's slightly different. And so just to kind of give you a little bit of background about how I come to this. Um, I worked in a local authority. So I used to run a network of about 70 schools in one local authority, 120 in another. And then I created a pan London network as well. Um, And so what my kind of knowledge stance was, it was outside in. I am the outsider coming into your organization to give you this magical knowledge called restorative approaches. Um, And or the alternative would be people come to training And they would then be able to do bottom up restorative practice because they learned something. And one of the there's an article back in 1977 called The Myth of the Hero Innovator, which I hadn't read till about two years ago, um, which basically said training individuals will make no difference um, because you have to look at the system uh, in which they're going to engage in. So that's why it's the myth of the hero innovator. So. Taking that point, I also used to work with head teachers and kind of go, can we look at a top down approach as well? So if you buy into this, then that will change the system as well, because your your role modeling will cascade 
knowledge as well. And that seemed to fail as well. Um, and I, the reason why I say fail is because having run all of these networks, they weren't particularly sustainable and probably kind of mid noughties I started to become increasingly concerned taking the point that Anna made earlier, which is, well, what difference am I making if I'm building all of these networks? But after a few years, they seem to be crumbling. Um, and I think there's kind of two aspects to that. There's knowledge dissipation, which is where we suddenly say everything is restorative in education. So, you know, walking a child in the playground, that's a restorative conversation. Well, you might be sharing valuable values and principles, but not necessarily call that a restorative meeting. So there is this watering down of restorativeness, if you like, so that it becomes almost meaningless because everything is restorative. And the other aspect of that is that knowledge, I would argue, is very much situated and contextualised. And so schools are predominantly punitive. So you are always working in a punitive system um, when you're working within education. And I think the danger that researchers tend to make is that they're enacting restorative um, interventions without acknowledging the punitiveness and the resilience of the system to this idea because it is so countercultural. So my um, PhD research was looking at the sustainability of restorative approaches. I know it's a hot topic. What do we mean by this? Um, but I was really interested in what happens after three years. What happens to an organisation once the researchers or the government initiative walks away? What is left? What remains in the system after that? And the reason I keep using the word system, I'm very specific. I'm thinking about the ecosystem. The school is an ecosystem, which means that knowledge has to compete with other forms of knowledge. So someone just talked about trauma informed. Well, that's now part of the ecosystem of education. And restorative approaches either has to synergize with it, marry with it or compete against it because the knowledge that we carry in systems is finite, I would argue. And this kind of leads to the conversation about how I think about knowledge. Um, years ago, I asked a police officer who wanted a copy of one of my PowerPoints. Um, I said to him, do you think knowledge is like gold or do you think it's like a peach? And he kind of stared at me like, like, like whoa, sorry. Um, and I said, well, if you think it's like gold, you'll be able to transmit the value of my presentation to your offices, easy peasy, and it won't lose any value over time. But if you believe that knowledge is like a peach, it means it's got to be nurtured, it's got to be grown, and you've got to create the right conditions for that knowledge to grow as well. So this is why when we're thinking about knowledge, what type of knowledge are we talking about? And so from my kind of my research, what I became really interested in was, well, what happens post three years to the knowledge in schools? And what started to come out quite clearly was two kind of key findings was, first of all, the mechanistic management system starts to dominate. So we start to talk about restorative outcomes in terms of agreements reached, participants, demographics. So we're reducing the knowing of restorativeness down to finite numbers and preferably on a spreadsheet, or we can rag rate it in some way, like red, green, amber, depending on process. So there was this reductionist element in the system. But then the second thing that happened that I found much more shocking in my own research was that restorative approaches over time gets coerced by the punitive system by which it works in. So over time, teachers were using the language of restorative interventions to get children back into class. So they weren't necessarily interested in the harm that was caused to relationships, particularly in teacher-pupil conflict, but much more, how do I use this language to get you back into class and feel like you've repaired the relationship? So if you think about Niels Christie's Conflict as Property, where he said those people most affected have to come together, what was happening was the dominance of the punitive system over time subsumed that into, well, what's the primary purpose of the educational system to educate children? And what's the quickest way to get them back into education? Well, use restorative language. So there is this, this coercive aspect to systems that is sometimes misunderstood, I would argue, because we have such a short termism about the projects that are created, the implementation strategy. And so in the language of education, they talk about the whole school approach. And I would challenge everyone to tell me where does the whole begin and where does it end? Because then you've got to think about boundaries in your systems. And so some people would say that the easiest way to find a boundary is to head to the margins. Others would say, no, boundaries are thresholds and it depends what's going on at those points of interactions. So I would sometimes, well, I would suggest that the term whole school approach is probably dated at best or irrelevant now, because one of the things that has really clearly happened is that 
within the English educational system, we are no longer kind of central government dictates to schools. We're much more of a market. So within this kind of postmodernist, um, fragmented educational system, people are being much more subjective about what restorative means to them and how it can be used, partly because we have a market model of delivering training as well. So trainers create and change and adapt restorative approaches to meet their clients as well. So you will get some trainers who say, well, we just need quick wins. So, you know, have a restorative detention. And there we're kind of, we're colluding with the punitive side of the system. Whereas other people say, no, you need to be really values-based and principle driven. And schools would say, well, we are that because we care about children, but they are blindsided by the fact that the system is still punitive. It's much easier to get a punitive intervention with no evidence into a school than a restorative evidence, a restorative intervention with high levels of evidence into that same school. So from my perspective, I really like the, the point about um, knowledge exchange because systems are constantly exchanging information with their environment. And that feels much more participatory to me. But again, we have to be mindful around what's the tokenism that is being played out when we're doing such things. So are we allowing people to come to meetings because we want to hear that genuinely hear their voice? Or do we want to come to meetings because actually we want to tell them this is the outcome that the school expects you to have? So I think there are some real challenges in terms of the way in which restore, the restorative field thinks about organisational change and the knowledge exchange that goes with that as well. Because there are real risks in my own research that came about, which is that the coercive, punitive aspects of the system create a dominant ecosystem in which restorativeness has to fight continuously to get heard and at best if you want it to be sustainable within that system it becomes a niche in the system within its own bubble it can survive but it won't necessarily take the point I think someone made earlier about critical mass and tipping points it won't tip into because there isn't enough system energy if you like to create a tipping point that will be sustainable in the long run and by sustainable remember I'm just talking about after three years you know, does it continue to survive after that with the level of integrity that was originally intended when that came about? So from my perspective, I've become absolutely fascinated by systems change and thinking about how the sum of the system can be either less than or more than the parts of the system as well. So there are opportunities, I think, for schools and for criminal justice systems and educational systems to really adopt this idea of restorative approaches, but we have to say, what is it trying to achieve? And from my perspective, the English criminal justice system was trying to reduce exclusions. Like that's our big goal. You know, if you can reduce exclusions, that's something that we can say the system is seeking to do. From a kind of systems perspective, you can never change a system by having a deficit model. So simply saying we want to reduce something won't change a system. You have to get a system, particularly an ecosystem, to move towards something. And I've been really fascinated over the last five to seven years about the idea of peace in schools and what does peace mean in communities. So rather than simply trying to uh, reduce exclusions, how do we promote peaceful schools? Because then a restorative intervention is the ideal process that enables that to happen. A punitive system cannot achieve peace in creating both a sense of achievement and a sense of belonging. So for me, that's where a lot of my work at the moment sits in terms of saying, if I'm working with a prison, a school, a community, well, what does peace mean to you? Respecting the local knowledge of the ecosystem is crucial. And then how do we use this restorative intervention to go about creating peace that will be meaningful for you in your community? And in doing that, I hope we can create the context for sustainability because the more people talk about peace, the more we need mechanisms and processes that allow us to create and sustain peace. I hope that makes sense. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I think it makes sense. I also think it's challenging. Um, <laughs> we've, we've got, I think, a hard question from uh, Jose Pineda. So it goes straight to you, Luke. Um, are principles of restorative justice consistent with trauma-informed care concepts? And if so, how can we hitch their wagons together? Okay, so good question. So I think there's a question of what's the integrity of both models? So if we're saying that trauma-informed means recognising that something that's happened because of a conflict, then how does restorative approaches address that? 
if we're saying that the trauma that has been created, for example, for a child is something separate to the conflict, well, then do you need a restorative intervention at all? So it's about recognising where's the value of the combination of the two. I think the problem that I would argue is it doesn't matter whether you're talking about trauma-informed schools, restorative schools, addressing racism, um, equalities more generally. The challenge is that the system only has so much knowledge in it that it can maintain and concentrate on at any one point in time. So this kind of goes a bit back to the question about stickiness. How do you get teachers who, for example, aren't specifically trauma-informed to recognise that that might be of importance to them. So are we saying that we need to spread that knowledge throughout the system, or are we saying it's better to have niches in the system that are able to specialise in dealing with those particular aspects? So in my model, the, in the way I think about systems, I would say that ideally you'd want both, but you have to recognise that schools are punitive. So both restorativeness and trauma-informed are fighting in this punitive ecosystem to get attention, to survive, to try and sustain themselves. So yeah, ideally you would like the two to come together because then that saves energy in the system. But in doing so, do you just go back into a niche again? Thank you. Uh, Let's look um, at our commentators and to see if they would like to respond to this sort of education focus that we've had uh, over the last 20 minutes or so. Um, Edit, Gail or Vivian, would you like to pick up any of the themes that we've had? From Luke. Well, thank you, Gail. Th- thank you. There's so much uh, happening here. I, um, I'm, I'm. Um, I, your last comment about the trauma-informed <clears throat> and the restorative justice competing for time is magnified uh, here in this country um, by the essential competitiveness of all programmings, the silos they belong into, the funding streams they belong to. And I, I'm, I'm less hopeful that that's gonna be worked out at that level of people uh, who are all professionals and have their, their own interests in, in uh, doing good. I don't doubt any of that, but that it seems to me a lot of the conversations are happening at a wrong level rather than bubbling up from below that they're still continuing to get funneled into these conversations of people who are on a payroll somewhere to come to meetings. And going back to an earlier comment that Canberra realized along the way that who shows up and how do they show up to have conversations about restorative justice and what's going on in the world and what does this mean to problems is key to these issues. And those people who uh, are on state payrolls and have missions, when they start showing up to meetings that they aren't being paid for, then I think we've got something sustainable. If they're there for their own interests, can tell stories about the impact on their own families, can relate to their own lives, to their own children who might have drug problems, then I think we see a measurable um, um, impact of restorative conversations. As soon as we get back to the level of signing MOUs between professionals to divvy up the turf of these things, I, I always take a step back to say, wait a minute, we, we uh, are so <clears throat> determined to follow the money all the time that we lose sight of the, the essential relationships that have to be held on to if we want to impact things at a long distance. Thank you so much for your comments, Luke. Yeah. I mean, following the money rather than following your values uh, is a challenge, I think, in what Luke was saying, as well as you, Gail. Uh, Edith and Vivian, would you like to pick up that theme? Yeah, um, so much of what Luke said resonated for for me as well. And uh, for example, his description of organizations as ecosystems where theories and practices have to compete, certainly from my experience as the head of of an organization in the criminal justice system, that that, uh, in in the past, that that really resonated for for me. Um, And I do uh, take up what Gail has just said about who shows up and how. And I I think that's really important. But I also think it's really important to understand 
who who is showing up and what their how is what their you know what their pressures are uh, whatever are um, and I was really again struck by what Luke said about reducing something won't make change happen and I think within the criminal justice system for example again speaking from a probation perspective um, probation is traditionally presented as an alternative to prison which is the most punitive institution we have so by def by some extension of that definition probation has to demonstrate punitiveness as well and similarly if the goal of probation as it frequently is certainly in this country and other countries to reduce reoffending we're further backed into that problem that luke has described whereas i think there has been more of a move in recent years for organizations like probation services to look at doing justice rather than reducing reoffending, uh, and I'm not saying that reducing reoffending shouldn't be in there, but there's a bigger picture in the same way that Luke described about schools and education systems, um, you know, needing to promote peace rather than to be punitive in terms of their, their underlying value or concept or whatever. So anyway, yeah, a whole lot of stuff going on for me in, in what Luke said, so thanks very much. Edit, would you like to comment too? Yeah, I think it was a really rich contribution. Thank you, Luke. And um, I think what it made me think about how difficult it is to, to implement sustainably uh, restorative justice in the criminal justice system, which is inherently punitive. And uh, even if I uh, go back to Anna's presentation on language, my native language translates criminal justice as penal justice. So that's somehow already in the name defined the final goal of that whole justice system. So um, achieving change from, from this, um, I think it's, it's really, really difficult and takes time. Um, and I think in that perspective, we also we also talk about changing systems, but also systems are 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 not stable constructs. They are they are always changing, and and in that sense, I think the next generation of professionals are really key. What kind of concepts uh, they take from their studies, and what kind of ideals they they start their career with, and so on. And I think. Um, in that sense, uh, the aspect of knowledge transfer uh, in, in uh, the higher education uh, is really key for the development of, of restorative justice. And uh, I, I myself studied law and still today, I think very, very, um, um, it's very rare that, that, that an average law student hears about restorative justice as such or, or, or learns about um, the key concepts and, and it can be true in, in many other disciplines as well. So I think for, for moving forward restorative justice in that sense, I, I really see it as a key uh, priority. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have time to delay uh, our programme just at the moment, but on the um, chat line, uh, I think there's been mention of um, two things, circles and their value, and also that restorative justice principles are not discussed enough and there isn't enough agreement about what they should be. So maybe an international seminar like that is opening uh, the discussion widely. So thank you very much for those comments. Now, we uh, do have to keep uh, our agenda moving. I'm hoping people f will forgive me for uh, uh, keeping us to the discipline of the time. Uh, but Luke, you clearly uh, sparked lots of uh, interest there, and let's hope we can keep that uh, going. Uh, we're going to move on now to uh, Branka's session. Uh, Branka is a facilitator, trainer, and evaluator with expe ex extensive experience in the field of civil society, social services, and social uh, inclusion. She's currently the senior expert at Creative Social Work Association, and she co-wrote the first mediation manual in Croatia. And it's just great that we now have yet another country that we can co concentrate on from uh, East and Central Europe. And the floor of the round table is now yours. Over to you, Branka. 
Thank you, John. And I want to thank you and uh, Anna Maria for setting the stage the way you did, because uh, Luke just gave the perfect framework for my presentation. And had I known him before, I would propose the two of us present together. <laughs> it's because, a deal. <laughs> yes, there. maybe next time. So, <laughs> there, uh, definitely. I will present you a case where uh, knowledge dissipation and watering down happened. So maybe at the end we will um, get uh, some understanding on how to uh, prevent that in the future. So I, first I will start with the inventory, what we have in Croatia. We don't have restorative justice, we have mediation. We have several thousand people that received uh, basic mediation training. We have uh, three generations of postgraduate students that completed family mediation seminars. We have uh, one PhD thesis and several undergraduate theses focusing on restorative justice. And we have several NGOs that are promoting restorative approaches for their work in uh, refugee integration, in facing difficult moments from Croatian history, in advocating for a civic education curriculum. So uh, th there is a very visible line connecting them in the way they work, in the way they relate to their environments. And I would say it's clearly restorative. But we don't use the words of restorative justice. We usually use peace building or mediation or conflict resolution. And uh, what we don't have is we don't have restorative justice mentioned in any policy document, in any legal document. Uh, we don't have secured funding for any publicly available mediation service. And we don't have any person, professional, academic or volunteer whose entire uh, work time or focus is restorative justice. So how did it happen? Having in mind that during the 1990s, as a part of response to the war and as part of re uh, relief and recovery efforts, so many um, Time, so much time and efforts was put in uh, transferring skills in nonviolent conflict resolution to first peace building activists and then to citizens, primarily teachers, who were the first one to figure out that they need that knowledge. Because we lived in a country that controlled only 75% of its territory, and we lived in a country where classes were so increased, like up to 45 students, and many of them were displaced or refugees and severely traumatized. And there were many tensions in neighborhoods, in workplaces, some towns were divided by the front line. So activists supported by foreign mediators and conflict resolution experts just started uh, teaching other people how to deal with conflict empowering others to start training. And we had um, several hundreds of people that had that knowledge, but we called it peace building. And now when I looked at the materials, it's very, very similar to the materials of training in restorative justice. And the same values were reflected. Uh, I would say this was the first stage of developing uh, mediation in Croatia. And second stage came with the new buzzwords and with the new priorities um, in international support. And those buzzwords were democratization, market economy, and preparation for EU accession. And support started to be different. Instead of targeting self-selected people were, who were highly motivated, they started selecting specific professional groups. So some lawyers and law professors and judges uh, were taking to US to a study visits to prepare them to become mediators in civic cases. Or uh, people in chi child protection from judiciary and from social work were taking to the Netherlands to see how child protection works. Norway organized study tour 
for those who uh, trained in civic mediation. Austrian trainers from Neustadt came to train the group of first 24 mediators for out-of-court settlement. So uh, these trainings uh, were done in a way that was much more closed towards the uh, general public. You, you couldn't apply. You couldn't be interested in it because there were specific institutions and specific people that were invited. Uh, and what was um, common to these efforts is that focus was increased, uh, in, focus was on increasing capacities of individuals and of specific organizations, and context was neglected. Stakeholders and public in initial analysis were not taken into consideration. So activities that were designed did not uh, involve them. And there was lack of long-term exit strategy that would secure sustainability and results and mechanisms and structures. So mediation, or before that, peace building, would uh, be alive. No. What happened in 2013, we became member of European Union. And with that, support from the outside for initiatives reflecting restorative values and for initiatives uh, that would enhance conflict resolution in any form, shape, or kind in our institutions ceased. National uh, funds were not available. So basically, NGOs were forced to pretend that they're working some on something else, like empowering women to get employment uh, on priorities that were priorities of seven-year EU funding program. Uh, and we had um, some uh, failures of continuing doing policies like we, were, we learned in um, pre-accession period. So strategy for civil society expired in 2016 and we didn't have a new one. Out-of-court settlement was last time mentioned in a strategy for youth from 2011 to, to 2014 and never mentioned again. And mediation in school now relies on enthusiasm of teachers who are doing it in their free time. So basically, dissipation of knowledge and watering down of um, the values and principles is already um, in progress. And uh, I, I, I'm afraid that uh, a lot of resources that were put into capacity building in Croatia just uh, got thrown away because it's not visible right now. So I hope uh, events like this will help us to figure out what to do next and how to deal with it because there are people who care about it and who would like to see restorative justice uh, prevailing in that competition of different kind of interventions. And uh, we just need to figure out how. And I think we, we need to cooperate with uh, people from other countries who face uh, similar challenges. And I will stop here. Thank you, Branka. Um, now, you've thrown the challenge out to us because as the funding stream stopped, um, in a way, uh, the enthusiasm did not go away, but maybe the resources did. And uh, it would be very interesting to ask uh, the, our panel what their advice would be uh, about finding ways of sustaining uh, the work on mediation and restorative justice within the systems. Okay, Edit, do you, from a European Forum perspective, uh, have... Uh, methodologies for en enabling countries like Croatia, who've had the funding tap turned off, to be able to keep the work going? I would be really happy if, if we could say, yes, we have it. And <laughs> so I think, I think what the European Forum uh, tries to do is at least to, to offer an international network. Um, and I think it was visible in Canberra how influential it can be to have 
experts from abroad to have discussions and conversations with with people with similar situation from other countries or or being able to implement projects together that brings at least um, some funding maybe um, I know that 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 this kind of operation cannot sustain or even uh, develop um, practices on a long term, but I think it can keep that individual um, inspiration and individual motivation of the professionals that would fade away if, uh, if no internal support is available. So that's one aspect maybe that, that I hope can help. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I think Anne, Anne uh, uh, Oprea would like to make a comment. Just a very brief comment and kind of to echo what Branka has said, coming from a Eastern European country, I think the things that she mentioned about Western pressures and what I think what I reflected when I'm thinking about my home country, Romania, and the fact that actually, again, restorative justice doesn't exist, but we have mediation in criminal matters, which we call penal mediation, like Edith says, um, how that came about and what was the interest and what was the pressure, what was the priority. Accession to EU, for example, was one of the rationales, the reasons for the change to happen for that institution to be established. So, in countries like this ones, I think we need to acknowledge what the priorities are, who sets the priorities, and what's the local interest. Because the case of Romania is that penal mediation is a private business. And I was speaking with Mary about this yesterday, reflecting whether the change needs to happen in the whole system and whether that's going to ever happen and who's going to have the interest to make that change happen because Penal mediation, as my data that I collected two years ago shows, the practice is very much about transferring money. It's a transaction between victims and offenders, and it's offender-oriented. And is there a place and a space for restorative values and restorative thinking to be embedded when the interest of mediators is to have as many cases coming and going to get their offices running because they're for them is a business? So I'm going to stop there and just made me highlight what resonated from Bronca's presentation for me was what are the pressures, who says the priorities and what are those and are there local interests that kind of are competing for um, or maybe working against um, yeah, what Green and, um, and Johnston are, are phrasing restorative expansion. Um, uh, one of our viewers, Marianne Liebman, says that she has experienced exactly the same as Branka from Serbia. So again, this idea of uh, lots of attention while there's a project, but when the funds dry up, um, sustaining the impetus is very, very difficult. So I'm wondering if other uh, experts around the table can uh, pr provide ways of sustaining or sustenance uh, advice. Thank you, Fiona. Would you like to come in, please? Um, I think we've made a conscious decision. Um, with, there's been a little bit of money in terms of the the to employ me, basically, when I did the um, the restorative interviews and all of that sort of stuff. But um, and we've had minimal assistance from government, and we sort of have deliberately done that. We haven't incorporated, we haven't done anything that makes us a fundraising body. What we've done is tried to establish those relationships and build out into um, the community. Now, specific projects are done with um, things. We've had some phil philanthropic support, um, Mary just reminded me, um, which um, helped us to bring Paul Nixon over at one stage. Um, a lot of the people who came internationally came as self-funded through, like <laughs> we would give them a car ride around between cities and stuff like that to, um, to if they had to fly into a conference somewhere, we'd bring them down to Canberra and we'd have set up, Mary and I would have set up meetings with key players around the place for those people or set up public consultation phases where the rest of the community could hear about it. So I think you can still do things without major amounts of money, um, but it just it basically means that you need to um, 
to have that frequency of relationship, which is, I think, what one of the advantages we've got with having two meetings a month um, where we all talk to each other. And we used to drink and eat, um, but um, with COVID, we haven't been able to do that fun bit. <laughs> Um, but still people have been coming and we would get 15 or 20 people on on um, on our Zoom conferences each twice a month. So I think um, and we're all working in different areas um, that we're passionate about and we're actually able to share those experiences. So I think it can be done. It just um, is a completely different model than what's traditionally thought of. So it's, it's interesting that it's resources come from the people with the same values, not just cash. And I think that is worth remembering, no matter how impoverished your uh, your nation seems to be. Okay. Um, one of the things, that, this is a personal point, so I'll make it quickly. I think having champions who can win public relations attention can also be helpful. An eminent lawyer, for example, or maybe uh, somebody from uh, who's in the public eye backing a campaign can make a big difference. Um, so always remember that as a, as a hook upon which you can hang a campaign or particular attention. Uh, anybody else? Um, perhaps Vivian, would you like to comment about this? Yeah, and I think Janet then also has her hand up. Um, but from yeah, yeah from, from my point of view, I, I sometimes would have found that the, the issue of resources, where resources appear to be available through particular grants, for example, can be seductive in the sense that it, it, it can attract one, it can attract me to get involved in something. But as Anna said, um, really there's a more fundamental question about why, you know, why am I doing it? What's the... What's the motivation and the pressure? And in my experience, personally, I, I would have felt that a you know resources in terms of money isn't or shouldn't be the primary uh, need for for any new initiative. Obviously, you need some resources to do something, um, but really there are other factors like the you know the 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 motivation, the drive, the leadership, um, the culture, whatever. That are much more important in the in the longer term, and I saw in the chat uh, box, Mary, for example, has made other suggestions as well about how to uh, access resources either directly uh, in terms of financial resources or uh, help in kind and so on. So, anyway, my main point is, um, as has been said already, that you know money. Uh, a can be seductive where it's it's held out as being available, and B it's not the most important thing in terms of making change happen. Okay, yes. Also coming uh, in online, uh, try f philanthropic support, run conferences, get fees from that, get attention. Uh, also universities. Uh, often a good way of getting uh, specific uh, attention, uh, perhaps get uh, research projects focused on restorative justice. Uh, local radio, um, somebody saying that um, particularly good uh, resource and uh, they're very keen to run local stories. Um, now, uh, I think that somebody else had their hand up and it was Janet, wasn't it? Please come on in, Janet. Hi there. Yeah, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, the nature of the problem that we're dealing with is along the lines that while people are responding in an unconscious way to system pressures around them in whatever context they're in, um, there will always be the problem of setting up a system that has a set of incentives for everybody such that when they're responding unconsciously to those incentives, they will behave in a restorative way. And I think we can short circuit that um, by thinking in terms of um, personal orientation and commitment to um, some very simple um, sort of things such as I think the way that in the University of Canberra we've adopted the language, um, somebody on the, on the chat talked about talking about principles, we need to talk about principles more often. Um, and we talk about putting respectful relationships at the heart of every interaction and we talk about ensuring that the most vulnerable voices can resonate at the highest levels of the system. And th those, that language is actually borrowed from our Maori, from our New Zealand friends. Um, and for me, it, the, what the system is doing is irrelevant to me in being able to 
as an individual, wherever I find myself, I can look around and see ways to put respectful relationships at the heart of every interaction I have and to use every resource I may have at my disposal at any given moment to ensure that vulnerable voices are heard at whatever the highest level is that I can bring them to. Um, and I think what, what I find useful about the Canberra setup is that we have a way to resource ourselves in the sense of giving each other heart, giving each other courage to continually reorient ourselves to those things when we too are under those pressures, those system pressures. So, you know, my day-to-day -day life, like everybody else's, is constantly pushing me away from listening, away from taking time for people, um, away from doing things that don't serve my interests. Um, but that supportive network is there to remind me and also to encourage me that actually I'm not about that. Um, so it, that sort of can sound quite airy-fairy, but I think in a very practical sense, it cuts through a lot of the troubles that we can sort of see ourselves hemmed in by if we're looking to try and set up systems that make it easy for us to behave in the ways that we've decided to behave. Maybe it doesn't need to be easier. Maybe we need to help each other to be more courageous, be more determined, whatever it, you know, whatever it might be. So that's, yeah, what, for whatever that's worth, I don't know how it'll be received. It's worth a great deal. Uh, Luke, I think you had your hand up. I'm going to come to Kelvin in, in a couple of minutes as well um, to ask you um, what, what your thoughts are about this. But let's start with Luke and then go to Kelvin. Yeah, I think, thank you, John. I think in terms of um, Baranka's challenge, for me, there's kind of three types of knowledge at play here. There's the knowledge to implement, there's the knowledge to embed in a system, and there's the knowledge to innovate. And I think that last bit about innovation is when knowledge becomes localized to your ecosystem. So you all create something that none of us are aware of because it's unique to your challenge, your situation. And I've seen that happen in certain organizations, like whether that's schools or in prisons, where they've come up with something that is so clever and so um, tantalizingly different to the narratives that I've heard before. I know they've, they've owned it. They've applied the principles, they've changed the process, they've crossed boundaries in some way. And I think that enthusiasm for the creative aspects of restorative justice and restorative approaches is often forgotten at the local level, but it can mean so much. The important point is to tell the story that goes with that creativity. That's crucial, I think, because then that becomes an attractor in the system that you've got something different that nobody else has. So how can we learn from you? How can we gain knowledge? And that then focuses the system's attention once again on why that was important in the first place. Thank you. Um, Kelvin, how, how do you think uh, restorative justice can be sustained in Nigeria? Well, uh, like, like I explained earlier, uh, restorative justice is new here. Uh, in this part of the world. And um, for the short time that I've been in practice here, we've seen the benefit. We've seen the benefit. At least we've helped to, it has helped to reconcile victims and the offenders. And uh, it has also helped to, uh, in some way, decongest our congested correctional facilities in this part of the world. Well, um, correction, uh, restorative justice can be sustained if uh, we get more of our personnel, especially correctional officers, trained in the practice of uh, restorative justice. Uh, we also appreciate if um, if the uh, uh, our our uh, universities can offer courses uh, in restorative justice, uh, where one can go and get uh, diplomas or degrees, uh, or be properly trained in restorative justice. Uh, as I as I speak to you, we don't have more or many, we don't have many uh, experts in correctional or in uh, restorative justice here in Africa. So uh, for it to be sustained. Uh, we need to get more people trained in rest restorative justice. We need to create awareness and uh, we need uh, more training institutions to train uh, more people in this regard. Absolutely. And, and maybe, they, maybe they can watch this YouTube, Calvin. 
Okay, well, we're coming to the end of our time. There's just time, I think, for three uh, provocative comments from outside. Um, Rob Canton says, restoring what exactly? Uh, some events expose uh, things uh, that we really need to change, not just restore. Uh, Marion Liebman uh, says that she uh, went to a talk recently about peaceful schools in Utrecht. So this idea is spreading by word of mouth. Um, Stephen Allende um, says the name of Paolo Friere uh, comes up everywhere um, and grounded exchange of knowledge is very, very important. Now, we, we seem to have provoked um, lots of discussion and um, for that I'm very, very grateful. Um, thank you to our presenters and to um, our four uh, restorative justice experts from around the world. Uh, those of you who've got up very early, those of you who've stayed working late into the evening, uh, thank you so, so much. Now, it's really tempting as the chair to have the final word, and that's an, a mistake. So what I'd like to do is just to quickly go to each continent and ask if you've got a sentence for us. So let's start with Gail in the United States. Do you have a sentence that you'd like to leave our audience with today? I'm horrible at bumper stickers. I, I, um, what's in my mind right now is the, the, the crucial role that restorative justice enthusiasts like myself must take up in terms of myth busting. What, what's missing uh, is is uh, we have all kinds of images and approaches to top-down accountability and regulation. What we're trying to discover, I think, in restorative justice and transformative justice world is how to hold one another uh, accountable in sustainable ways relationally in conversations and to let that knowledge flow up and outwards. We've been caught in a terrible position especially in this country that I'm in, having all kinds of myths about protections and rules and laws that were supposed to be there to protect ourselves from the emergence of, of throwing caring out the window. And I think in some ways by connecting with other like-minded social movements and uh, breaking down the barriers between disciplines is our best hope of having a unified approach to requiring accountability and challenging the myths about uh, top-down uh, control. Thank you. Well, it's, it's, it's a lovely, lovely uh, wrap-up conclusion. Edit, would you like to have a final comment to our audience? Yes, thank you, John, and thank you, for uh, Anna, for, for initiating um, this webinar, and I think... It was amazing to, to be together and share views uh, with all of you from, from four continents. It's, uh, it's really a privilege um, to join this conversation and I hope the conversation will continue. Um, maybe two aspects from the work of the European Forum for Restorative Justice. Uh, our initial aim and our, 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 our aim is still to, to create a network which brings together practitioners, researchers, and policymakers, and I might add also educators or trainers. I think it's really important to, to, to have these discussions and exchanges uh, beyond our, our usual professional groups. And, and um, that's one aspect I think uh, uh, I find important in our work. And also with the forum, uh, we might focus a little bit on, on, on social impact in the coming years, because we see a big gap in knowledge uh, on what is the social impact of restorative justice. So that could be uh, maybe a topic uh, of a following discussion, but uh, thanks a lot. I learned a lot from all of you today. Well, I'm going to have to draw this to a conclusion. Um, I'm hoping that it's been one of those uh, seminars where your head and your heart have been equally challenged. Uh, but maybe we'll only know if you then are spurred to action. And uh, here at INCJ, we are delighted to have had so many people involved. Please do 
visit the website and do follow us on, on Twitter as you will. Our next seminar takes place on the 26th of April. It's not far away. And it's going to be similarly international and is going to be on cyber supervision. Uh, we have international speakers. It would be great to have you join us. And so from uh, here in Bedford, England, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us. Uh, goodbye for now. And thank you to all our contributors. Goodbye. Keep well. Stay safe. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.